So this this article here is written by Patricia Park, a Korean American born here in New York City. And uh, I read the article, and you can sense the frustration in the words she uses. Uh, she starts out with the title, I'm done being your model minority. I'm supposed to hear stop the hate. And she writes, growing up in New York City, I learned street smarts early. I kept my head down, my money in my sock, and my mind on my business. At 12, I started riding the subway alone. And in high school, I commuted four hours a day from Queens to the Bronx. When a classmate was slashed in the face by a stranger at our school subway stop, I still took the train home that day and every day after. It takes a lot to face me. And yet, as an American of Korean descent, I now fear for my life and the lives of those who look like me. The New York Police Department reported 131 biased incidents against Asians last year, up from 28 in 2020, right? and 3 in 2019. That increase doesn't account for last week's most recent spate of hate. Police officers arrested a man and charged him with assaulting seven Asian women in a two-hour spree in Manhattan, during which he allegedly punched or elbowed most of the women in the face and shoved one to the ground. And of course, not all attacks on Asians are recorded as hate crimes. In the past couple of months, Christina Yuna Lee was followed into an apartment building in the Lower East Side and stepped to death. Michelle Go was shoved onto the subway tracks in Times Square, and Yao Pen Ma died following months in a coma after he was forced to the ground and beaten about the head in East Harlem. Of these, only Mr. Ma's murder was labeled a hate crime. In February, a Korean diplomat was punched in the face near K Town the midtown Manhattan neighborhood where Korean businesses are clustered. In January, Hua Win was punched several times in the head on her way to buy groceries in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. Just this week, a 41-year-old Asian man's face was slashed on a subway train in Lower Manhattan. All of these attacks were unprovoked, and there were others too many to name them all here. No person deserves to live in fear of physical attacks, but sadly, fear is the state of the union for many in the Asian American community, Representative Grace Meng of Queens said last week. Asian Americans continue to be victims of senseless violence as we are scapegoated for the spread of COVID-19. I suspect that many more crimes and aggressions against Asians go unreported, in part because of language barriers or immigration status, but also because of a cultural phenomenon that is intuitively understood in our communities. It's the fear of disrupting our model minority reputation. My Korean immigrant parents often told me when I was growing up, don't make trouble. We are guests in this country. Never mind, <laughs> never mind that I was born here and that my parents are Americans too. Racism in this country is multifaceted, affecting each ethnic or religious group differently. When agents are attacked, we expect it to respond the way we have historically. Stay quiet and keep working. Heads down, as so-called model minorities, we excel at making, as masking our pain. Every Asian 
in America can recall incidents of verbal taunting or stereotyping, times we have been asked to make ourselves smaller. Some have experienced physical aggression or violence. Letting these incidents go unchecked, be they microaggressions or far worse, sends the message that our lives are less valued. Dehumanizing the population in subtle ways emboldens some members of society to attack in more harmful ways. I'm tired of how Asians this country are treated, pushed around literally and figuratively. This is why I've decided I'm done being your model minority. Throughout school and my early career, I used to play along with the expectations of Asians. I was grateful for every opportunity and my parents worked too hard, bagging groceries seven days a week because office jobs were not available to them for me to mess up. At one job in publishing, I was assigned to the math and science books that no one else wanted. I took all of them on without protest. Even when I stopped conforming to these expectations, I found that others still wanted me to adhere to the model minority stereotype. I started to realize why my parents had advised me to not make trouble. If I voiced any dissent, I was met with contempt and aggressively put it in my place. Nobody likes it when you play against type. As the Pulitzer winning author Viet Thang Nguyen puts it, Asian Americans still do not wield enough political power or have enough cultural presence to make many of our fellow Americans hesitate in deploying, deploying a racist idea. A paradoxical feature of the model minority is our simultaneous invisibility. When we are quietly working in the background, head down, and our hypervisibility, when we become easy targets, I'm tired of feeling terrified. This weekend at my niece's first birthday party in Queens, a celebration in Korean culture as big and joyous as a wedding, the table talk with family and friends was about how scared we are for our elderly parents. We are frustrated at how quickly non-Asian folks discount the role of race when they have not lived in our skin. We are tired of being perceived as weak, easy targets ripe for the pushing. We, especially as Asian women, feel threatened and helpless and silenced. We are starting to push back. Asian American female business owners are confronting racist and misogynistic threats from trolls online. In New York City, advocacy groups are calling for citywide action and legislative change to combat bias against Asians and others. Head down and mouth shut is no longer an option for many of us. We need voices, both Asian and non-Asian, to speak out. We are starting to realize that the bystander effect, seeing something but saying nothing when we witness incivilities or worse, is as dangerous as the attacks themselves. On the F train leaving Brooklyn, I recently saw a scuffle over an open seat in which a woman pushed an elderly Asian woman who barely cleared five feet and out of her way with both hands. The older woman staggered back. The taller woman took the seat. I spoke up, you don't have to push her. Then I looked around the train car, trying to enlist the help of other riders, but they all shuffled their papers and stared into their phones. Nobody met my eye. And to think, and the, and the, and the train by the way, uh, even on the bus also, uh, 
they advise you to give up the seat <laughs> to the elderly, to the disabled, you know, or people who have, uh, uh, let's say, who are handicapped, you see? So, from what she describes here, this, this elderly Asian woman, definitely you could see that she was elderly. And she was pushed by a much stronger woman, you know. So, according to the civil rules of the subway and the MTA, you know, whether you're on the bus or the train, you should please give up your seat to somebody who is elderly, somebody who is probably like uh, physically handicapped, disabled, or in one of those categories. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on. <laughs> you see? And she's right. She said that, she said that, she said, I spoke up. You don't have to push her. Then I looked around the train car, trying to enlist the help of, of other riders. But they all shuffled their papers or stared into their phones. Nobody met my eye. You see? Nobody, nobody would... Nobody would speak up. It's crazy. I, I remember years ago, I was on the train, and there was this, um, I would say there was this young lady, a black young lady. She's probably, I don't know, maybe late teens, early 20s. And there was an elderly black man sitting next to her. He looks like he was in his 80s. <laughs> And he had his hand in her, like like he was massaging her. And to me, she looked uncomfortable. She, so I was standing there, and I was observing. And I couldn't help, but I asked. I said, do you know this man? I looked at her. I said, do you know this man? And she said, no. I don't know him. And I said, mister, get your hands off of that girl right now. And that's exactly what he did. He removed his hand. Sometimes you have to speak up. I mean, yeah, he was an old man, but, you know. But the whole idea is that I guess she was so in shock, thinking, you know, here's this old man. He could be, I don't know, maybe a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and he's touching her. Maybe she felt this guy was, you know, needed confidence. She didn't know how to, how to respond to him. So she let him be. But to me... That, that was definitely inappropriate, you know, and I asked her, do you know this man? And she said, no, I don't know him. So, you know, that's, that's no excuse whether you're old or what have you and you're sitting next to somebody young. That's no excuse to engage in, uh, in sexual misbehavior. No excuse to say I'm an old man. And I'm sitting next to a young woman, so yeah, here I go with my hands. No, that's wrong. And in the case of the elderly uh, Asian woman, the woman who pushed her who had enough strength, she should have at least given that woman the seat, you know? That's how, that's the rules of the, the, the transit system. You give the seat up to someone who is elderly. Somebody who may be pregnant. Somebody who are children, like kids, for example. You give you give the seat up. Now on the bus, there's certain there's certain uh, like at the very front of the bus, some of the seats are reserved for people who are like handicapped or elderly, and they specifically states that. However, um, you can sit there, but if somebody comes on in a wheelchair, what have you, then the driver will have you will have to get up. But if somebody is elderly, that's very different from somebody who is handicapped. The driver doesn't really have to get up to tell you that, but you should know that. That if somebody is elderly and needs that seat, and you sitting in a seat, and you're like 22 years old or something, you should you should get up. You know, and as I as I mentioned, if you like, like twenty two. I uh, when I was in Mexico back in December twenty twenty, 
I had to write, uh, you know, they had this bus, like a double-decker like. And um, the thing is, well, I wasn't familiar with it because I was like new there, just got there. And I went upstairs, I figured you know, I could see outside and so forth. And I want to get up at a certain point. By the time I got off, by the time I got downstairs, the door is closed and I asked the driver and he told me it closes within five, after five seconds, the door is closed. And I said, well, that's not right. And I wrote, um, yeah, I actually wrote the, I guess one, one of the, the people, I guess I reach in customer service. And she wrote me back in English, not in Spanish. And I complained. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what? You're discriminating against all the people, like men, all the men, for example, because it's like the policy is that at the bottom level of the bus, only like women and children can sit there, except like in the very front for like if somebody's like handicapped. Then you can sit in the handicap area. But if if you upstairs, you have to make it downstairs in time. And I saw one girl came, one young girl. She must have been in her early twenties. She fly down that stairs in no time, and she ran out, ran out the doors just in time. You know. But see, when you're older, you can't really do that. And the the lady from customer service wrote me back, and she said, "Well." No, we don't discriminate. So we kind of went back and forth. I still have the letters. I still have the emails. Um, so we kind of went back and forth. And they said, yes, you do. I said, lady, if if I were like 22 years old, we wouldn't be having this discussion. You know, yeah, that's true. If I were 22 years old, I would be able to run down those stairs. Because I remember when I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. I would be able to run down the stairs. When I was 22 years old, I had no problem walking up the subway steps, you know? Yeah. The subway steps are later on. Now I find, oh my goodness, these steps are really something. And they walk up. So as you get older, you, you feel the difference in your body. When, you, when you're young, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So, you know... People have to be able to accommodate, and I think, and I, and I wrote, and I said, that's wrong, you know. You have some of the women who sitting down on the, on the first level of the bus, some of them in their 20s, like mid-20s. And the whole idea is to say, well, uh, women, they've been, uh, I guess, uh, they've been like abuse, or, or it's to stop abuse against women in Mexico, you know. But one thing I got to say about, I was in Mexico City. Mexico City is much safer than New York. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> all the nonsense you see going on in New York, like in the subways and so forth. When I was in Mexico City, every, every subway station in Mexico City has police. Police are the entrance where you, where you uh, swipe your, your ticket or whatever to enter. And police on the platform when you go in. Also, they have like a separation when you enter. Like men and men would enter like one area, and women and children would enter another area. Of course, when you get in the train, it's different, you know. But that's how it is. And some of the buses, their police are the bus stop. And police sometimes ride in the bus. I know we see a lot of stuff coming out of Mexico. And people say, geez, I can't live there, you know. There's stuff that's going on and the cartels and all this stuff like that with the drugs and bodies hanging from uh, overpass. But not all of Mexico is like that. In Mexico City, where the, where the seat of the federal government is in Mexico City, it's very, very different. I mean, you can walk out 2, 3 in the morning, and you don't have to really worry. That's one of the safest parts of Mexico. 
So this is what kind of annoyed me because I was saying to myself, well, I wrote back and I told the lady in customer service, I said, you know, your city is much safer than mine where I live, which is true. Because look at the crazy stuff that happens in New York, like the, the Thai the Thai model who was out late um, one night. She went to see some um, some singer, a rap concert or something, guys raps in Thai. And some guy robbed her, I think it was, was a 34th Street, one of those streets. He robbed her. Then you have these incidents like the woman being pushed, pushed down the, at 42nd Street there, Times Square, pushed her at that. Then you have, uh, you know, lots of incidents, people being robbed, people being, you know, assaulted, uh, people being stabbed. Every day you see something crazy going on in subway. In, in Mexico City, you're not going to see that because in Mexico City, there are police at every station. <laughs> every station. And uh, the Mexico City uh, subway system is not a small system. It's not like it's only, you know, like some places you may only have like 10 stations. No, it's not like that. There are different branches to it. And it goes out quite a distance because I rolled with it. Um, like I went like way out one time to a completely different area with it. And at the very end, there are police there too. You know, there are police everywhere. From what I heard, they got like about a hundred thousand police, which we don't have. You see, we don't have that. Yeah. So they have police everywhere, and I was uh. <coughs> There's a park near, uh, there's like a, a building there, like the Beautiful Arts Building, and it was a Sunday, and uh, there were like police, like every, every 10, 15 feet you walk, there was like a police officer standing there, you know. It's hard for a criminal to commit a crime and expect to get away. Like all the stuff that you see happens in, in, in New York City where you have um, like people committing crime and then, okay, they say, yeah, we, uh, we got this in camera and we're looking for this, we're looking for this person. No, in Mexico City, it's not like that. In Mexico City, if you commit a crime, the police are going to get you right there. They're not going to be looking for you. They will have you. <laughs> That's the difference over there. They're going to have you. You can't expect to commit a crime and expect you're going to run away, and then the police are going to be, you know, looking for you. Sometime later, they're going to catch you. Like the guy who beat up the Thai model. I think it was in November last year, and they didn't catch him until after a while because they had him in custody for another crime he committed. They didn't even know, realize they had him and so forth. No, you know, all these subways we have, you have no police in them, you know, nothing. You go down and there, you are your own mercy, and sometimes it depends on the jobs you have. It's crazy. Uh, somebody uh, sent me an email the other day and she spoke to me about a job at Rikers Island. I don't even want to get into that because that would take me in, in, off on another tangent because I worked over there years ago to work like in the clinics. And the shift is like from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. So can you just imagine me getting out from Rikers Island Right, this is where the prison, you know, the local prisoners in New York City, the big prison in the island, across from LaGuardia Airport. You get out that time of night, and then to get from the building you're working in, you have to get to the main gate, and you have to wait on a correction officer's bus to bring you to the main. And I know because I worked there like maybe 20 years ago, so I know what I'm talking about. 
So you have to, unless you have your own car and you're driving, you know, then that's different. But if you don't have your car and you you have to wait until the bus comes around, picks you up, right, and then drop you at the main gate, and then you have to wait for a bus to take you from Rikers Island and then take you out to, like, Queens Plaza, for example. And then from Queens Plaza, you, you get in the subway or bus to take you home. Can you imagine the time <laughs> I would arrive home? Just like this lady in, in in the article said, she used to take, like, it used to be like four-hour trip going to school to the Browns, I guess from, what was it, Queens or Brooklyn, where she lived? Yep, that's how it would be. So, no way. I'm not going to do something like that. I reached a point in my life where, luckily, I don't really have to go out there and work like that. Sure. I would work, but it's something would be convenient or something that I would like doing. But there is no way I'm going to go to Rikers Island and work. But the whole point is that this city that we live in here, uh, the whole idea of going in the subway and all this stuff, people don't really follow the rules. You know, if somebody's elderly, and you're tall and strong, you're not going to push an elderly person just to get a seat. Knowing fully well this person is elderly and they have to be standing there. You know, whether the person Asian or not, it really doesn't matter. The point is, this person is elderly and you should give them priority. And if you're sitting, you should get up and give them that seat. That's the way it should work. Unfortunately, we live in a time and in a city where... Might makes right, and that's what it really comes down to, sadly.